to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And still he maintains his integrity, though you incited me to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, then he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it <clears throat> as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Should we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together uh, by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. They sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Okay, well, aren't you glad you're not Job? Um, so that's the prologue. Here's the story. All of this happens because of an unseen interaction between God and Satan behind the scenes. And I guess Satan has nothing better to do than wander around and pick, pick on people and provoke things. Um, now the friends show up and that sort of sparks these dialogues um, that continue on for the first half of the book of Job. And uh, it would be, first they came, they didn't say anything. Um, and, and I think the reason for that is in ancient Near East, if, in a situation like this, um, a person in that kind of distress, friends and family typically wouldn't speak until spoken to until Job actually spoke. And so that's the reason, other than perhaps they were traumatized and know what to say, uh, but probably they didn't dare to speak until Job himself um, speaks. And so now he's lost his children, he's lost his wealth, and now he's lost his health, so he has physical misery to add on to the mental um, misery. And in a sense, I think what God has allowed to happen um, is for Job to be stressed out um, all the way up to everything except for actually dying, because God said, okay, spare his life, but other than that, he's, he's in your hands. Um, so we're going to kind of work through these rounds of dialogues and just um, I'll, I'll allude to certain verses and read some of them and then maybe I'll ask some of you to read uh, a couple of them as well. Um, and you'll see as we do that certain questions arise and certain themes with those questions arise, um, both from Job and from his friends. And ultimately the relationship as it develops through these dialogues becomes very toxic. And finally Job washes his hands and says, don't talk to me anymore. And the three friends say, well, we're not gonna talk to you because you become self-righteous. Uh, and then we have that little interlude and then Elihu, another friend, 
comes in uh, to hopefully offer a new solution to the impasse. Um, I feel that it's the same old story, that he doesn't really resolve anything or add anything new. Uh, and then finally, when God speaks, um, everybody has to listen. And uh, we'll look at uh, how God speaks and kind of wrestle through that because he doesn't come uh, as a kindly comforter, but as a confronter to Job. All right, so uh, Job speaks, chapter 3. I'm just going to start out and read a little bit. Um, After this, his buddies had been hanging for seven days, just being near him. Job finally opens his mouth and said, and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish. And the night it was said a boy is born, that day may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine upon it. May darkness and deep sorrow claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm its light. That night may thick darkness seize it, may it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered in any of the months. May that night be barren, may no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day. And he's speaking there, of course, of the day he was born. What do you think he was feeling? Probably the dark depression, uh, just wipe it out. It it would have been better for me never to have existed. Uh, And he goes on. um, Verse 17, there the wicked cease from turmoil and there the weary are at rest. Captives also enjoy their ease. They, are no long, they no longer hear the slave driver shout, the small and great are there, and the slave is freed from his master. Uh, why is light given to those in ministry and life to the bitter of the soul, to those who long for death that does not come, who search for it more than hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave? So his mind has gone into a very deep, deep place where um, he is almost looking at death as life. Why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul? Why does he still, he's saying, why is there still sun? Why is there light still shining on me? I should be dead. First of all, my birth should never have happened, but it did, so be better off dead. So let's... uh, uh, let's check out Eliphaz's response to this. And we'll just uh, look briefly at some of the things without going into detail. He, he, he launches into his thing um, in verse or chapter 4. Um, and these dialogues... Um, aren't really the friends saying, Job, could you share what you're feeling? They're the friends trying to counsel, instruct, correct Job. They're trying to fix it, I guess you would have to say. Um, And so they offer all these pieces of advice So five, uh, if we look at verse 17 of chapter 5, Eliphaz is speaking along and he says this. He said, blessed is the man whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. From six calamities he will rescue you, and seven no harm will befall you. So here, Eliphaz is kind of telling Job, God is correcting you. He's disciplining you. 
He's allowed this to happen. So what does that kind of hint? I mean, what is, what is underlying that? So, well, God is disciplining you. For what? Job was supposedly a righteous man. Um, well, there's a little idea there that somehow this is somewhat Job's fault that this happened. God's disciplining and correcting. Well, when, you're, when you get corrected, why do you get corrected? All right? Because there's something incorrect going on. You know, God wants to correct you because you've been off the path or in sin some way or... Um, So let's go ahead and, you know, Job has a reply to this, uh, chapter 6, he he starts, um, if only my anguish could be weighed, all my misery be placed on the scales, it would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. No wonder my words have been impetuous, the arrows of the Almighty are in me, my spirit drinks their poison, God's terrors are marshaled against me. And he goes on and on. Um, What do you hear there? Well, I think Job feels, he's probably feeling that he's the only one in the universe who's ever gone through anything as bad. You know, if only my anguish could be weighed. And then, Uh, feeling and understanding that, yes, indeed, God is sovereign. He must have let this happen. And he's just been told by his good friend that God is correcting him. So now he's faced with the idea that God, in some respects, might be an enemy or might be an inflictor of all of this stuff. So Bildad, friend number two, comes in in chapter 8. Let's look at a couple of things he says here. Chapter 8, I'll just read uh, the first eight verses. Uh, Then Bildad replied, How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering. He's speaking to Job here. Your words are a blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will look to God and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your rightful place. Your beginnings will seem humble. So prosperous will your future be. Ask the former generations and find out what their fathers learned. Okay. If you were Job, would that comfort you? (laughs) So, your words are a blustering wind. I mean, that's, that's kind of a poetic way to say, you're out to lunch, you know, quit babbling. Uh, and Job has voiced his, his concern that God might be afflicting him, that God might be against him. And of course, Bildad uh, is, is criticizing Job for making that kind of a statement, saying there's nothing wrong with God, Job. Don't say that God is this problem. You are the problem. Um, and Bildad does say things that are true. Surely, surely to, in verse 20, chapter 8, Surely God does not reject a blameless man or strengthen the hands of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed in shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. So there's a little bit of hope there. Um, and then in verse, uh, chapter 9, here's Job's reply to Bildad. And this is very telling to me because things really are kind of progressing in Job. He says here, indeed, I know that this is true. But how can a mortal be righteous before God? What a, what a question. Uh, though one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him on time, uh, one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound, his power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it. He overturns his anger. And so here Job is kind of uh, stepped back a bit and says, wait a minute. Yeah, I know I can't blame God. 
and, and, but how can a mortal man be righteous? Um, and I think the, the criticism and some of the stuff coming from the friends did cause Job a little bit to start looking within and realizing maybe I'm not as righteous. Um, so that may be a good thing for Job in the long run. Um, but then in, in uh, chapter 10, he sort of goes back into the depressive mode here. I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free rein to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me, but tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the schemes of the wicked? So the beginning of his reply, Job kind of hits a little note of humility. I'm not sure I can be righteous. And then as he thinks about that, again, his anger wells up within him and his sense of my life is ruined. I loathe it. Um, and verse 2 of chapter.